Ohio State is the undisputed, can't argue with it, first time ever real college football national champion. Or so say the various marketing wags who will take this game and sell the daylights out of future games, uh, not for the ability to showcase these wonderful amateur athletes and their academic achievements, but for the new mountains of money it will make everybody, except, of course, the players. This and other stick and ball discourses we shall address in welcoming back to Midpoint the undisputed, can't argue with it, real and true sports professor, the originator of the sports business genre, still trying to find some way to get the Miami Hurricanes back into the football title game. Rick Haro joins us here in studio. Good not, to see that's you. That's not possible. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's not, so am, am I one of those, am I a wag? You, you are. are a lot of wags. You are. You're, You're the only wags. guy I know, frankly, that can take this amazing juggernaut called college football and turn it into some conspiracy done in the back room there. It and is do a something conspiracy. To somebody, Let's right? be exactly. honest now. Wait a minute now. We're Urban talking Meyer, about the best coach of the decade, even more than Nick Saban, and everybody for the first time goes away happy. And they're all multimillionaires. The coaches right. are multimillionaires. The assistants are multimillionaires. The Conferences themselves are going to get $50 million each under the new system. That's conferences, correct. Five right. conferences. Right. And what are the players getting? Zip. Well, the players are getting a lot more than they did before. So let's hold that thought for a couple of years. Please. Because the bottom line is you got five power conferences all going through a governance structure, which now three of them have already guaranteed multi-year scholarships to these kids. There's going to be medical care. There are issues. Frankly, Northwestern had a union issue a yes. couple of years ago, and most of those issues that were on the table are being addressed in the context of governance now. And so part of this is paying student-athletes. The Rubicon about these are student-athletes, that's been long crossed. But that's long gone. That's, that's been since the gone. 80s, maybe, maybe 70s. But now we have the governing structure that is tempting to catch up to that. Give it a little bit of time. Not by next Tuesday, but ask me the same question <laughs> next year to the extent that you don't want me to be here and I may want you to may want to Careful be here. Now. And you'll get the same answer. Are we eventually right and direction. undeniably going to get to the college football players' union one of these days? No, because Why? I think what's going to happen is because these students are going to get the benefits that they really need without having to unionize. And again, more than anything, it's the medical care, it's the commitment of scholarships. It is I I inappropriate for coaches slash fatherly folks to be able to yank kids' scholarships halfway through a four-year term because they haven't performed. Most colleges now understand that's wrong and that's changing. So if those kind of things are changing without a union, I see no reason why these kids have to unionize, and I'm not not—I'm not any labor management guy. I'm just trying to be practical about it. Okay, but let's look at it from a business sense. There's talk about another, I think you and I have heard this for decades now, a presidential commission on college sports, yeah, a possibility of this. One. Plus there's something called the Coalition to Save College Sports. Right. Is, is, this, is this all just blowing hot air here to basically say, we're going to make it better, and these things business-wise will mean nothing? 72% of it is blowing hot air, but uh, watch the other 28% because those are the ones that are really trying to make a difference. President Obama has convened a top-level group at the White House, never done before, and politicians only do that, really, only do that and lay themselves out when they see a clear path to some kind of reform. Well, wait and, a minute, or to some kind of benefit for them because, to be honest, why should the president get involved right. in college athletics? Right, well... You know, if politicians weren't doing something that were, you know, benefiting them, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be doing anything. And so, so I guess the bottom line of all of this is that there is a clear understanding that the revenue that's generated, ESPN, $7 billion. Mm -hmm. The ratings for Monday Night Game were higher than any cable television show in history. Now, where does that money go? You're right. It goes in a certain direction. More money is being funneled to the right places. And again, it's a complex issue. What do you do about Title IX? What do you do about all these other sports? We understand how much money football and basketball make, but let's not forget the other sports as well. I only got about 30, 40 seconds left before we take a break, but real quickly now, L.A. NFL. Seriously now. I know that Cronkies building a stadium in Los Angeles, but is there any reason to think this is really going to happen? Do you realize you asked me to uh, chronicle 15 years of NFL Yes, I did. About That's why I seconds. did because I know you can do the it. The answer is the NFL right now uses L.A. as leverage. There may not be a reason why uh, an L.A. team is important to the NFL other than that leverage. Uh, Jacksonville, St. Louis, San Diego, Oakland, all looking. Cronky has a real estate play for a stadium. We'll see how it shakes out. Five years from now, do you think we'll see the Los Angeles Rams? Uh, five years from now, we have a team in L.A. But it may not be the Rams. Maybe somebody else. Okay. The Jaguars. Uh, you, you ask your questions. We come back 
Come back after the after this tease, ladies and gentlemen. Come back, and we'll continue with Midpoint. See, and it's nice too. And Rick also believes himself to be a director as well from time to time. <laughs> Three, uh, back two. Put your hands down, not in the camera. <laughs> One. Back for another go round with the sports <laughs> professor now, professor. Let's dive into what has to be the worst possible place to hold a summer Olympics. We'll also talk about Roger Goodell, and in the end, guess what? Whether we're talking Olympics or Roger Goodell, we're still going to follow a lot of money. It all comes up right here when we continue, Rick, on. Midpoint. Thank you very much. <laughs> so welcome back to Midpoint. The sports professor, the original voice of sports business around the world and available for public viewing every second of the day. At HaroSports.com, Rick Haro joins us in the studio. Got your plug in now. You happy? That was great. Uh, how, long, how long have you been in this business? Been a long time. Really? Don't go there. <laughs> Don't go there because we remember very, what happens in the break yeah. does not happen on the we, air. We had okay? a very interesting break, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead We're and get gonna, back to business yeah, here. Let's get back to business. The Summer Olympic Games and the United States has decided that Boston would be the site. I lived in Boston for four years. Yeah. I haven't spoken to one person who lives there who thinks this is a good idea, number one, as far as infrastructure, two, as far as traffic, and three, Rick, don't we know that all these places that host Olympics lose tremendous amounts of money? Most places that hold Olympics lose tremendous amounts of money, <clears throat> except for the places that use existing infrastructure as much as possible. L.A., London, great models. The Boston model is supposed to be that way. No guarantee it's going to happen that way, but Fenway Park, for baseball, TD Waterhouse, the arena basically for indoor sports, uh, the rowing on the Charles. So what it does in its appropriate way is use existing mass transit. I remember those days where you couldn't afford a car, so mass transit was pretty easy <laughs> for you. And you understand how important it is. So the legacy to be left behind for 2024, assuming the IOC chooses it over Rome and a lot of other cities, is uh, the first Olympics since Atlanta in 1996 and to be done the right way. But That's is the plan. it smart? Is that a smart city business-wise and dollar sense to hold an Olympics? Well, it is if you attract the corporate business they claim to be attracting because of that. And so when you go around one. planned follows those success stories. And remember, Mitt Romney involved in this bid, a Bostonian uh, as part of his life, had a very successful Olympics in Salt Lake City to follow from. All right, let's go ahead and turn to the National Football League here for a moment. The in continuing investigation, if you will, over Ray Rice, Roger Goodell. They found out they had their retired FBI investigator come in and said, Okay, now wait a minute. There you go. Yeah. That the NFL did not know about the existence of the second tape. Everything's clear. Roger Goodell comes out looking like he's completely the white horse in this. You're not buying it, are you? Well, there's a tape somewhere and evaporated, and I'm not really sure that it matters going forward who has the tape and where it is. I suspect it's in the back lot of those people that manufactured the lunar landing as well. It's somewhere in the <laughs> studio. But moving forward, which is really important, right. there is a domestic abuse policy, six-game suspension. Some people call it onerous. It is a very clear standard now. Should it have happened a year ago? Darn straight. But it's happened now, and everybody says that by the Super Bowl, this is where we move forward. Super Bowl 49 in the Valley may be the biggest Super Bowl ever because it's the time where 41% of the avid fans or female fans who candidly, according to Kenner Media, watch the commercials more than they watch the games. And so if this is the time where it's the watershed, let's move forward with our ads and all the money we're spending now and do this right, it's a new beginning. If not, then we go back to the same old ways. 60 seconds. Uh, all the people that I know are screaming, hollering, whining about all these close calls late in games. Uh, first of all, the call against Dallas was absolutely correct according to the rules, the yes. way they are written right very, now. Very well done. Few, but, first thing I've ever agreed with you on. People say, it is the first. People saying the NFL's done, it's over, they can't get their, their, their game straight, I'm not going to watch it anymore. These calls will not have one penny's worth of business change in the NFL, will it? You found somebody who said that they're not going to watch the NFL Dozens. anymore Dozens. because of those calls? Well, let me tell you, the controversies around those circumstances would have made half the people unhappy no matter what. Catch, no catch, you could debate either side of that. And I guarantee you that the real fans are going to continue to watch the NFL and spend money. Take it to the bank. They won't go away because they love it. And not only that, Take but something like this, just because we're talking about it, and the morons sometimes on Sports Talk Radio, it's the only thing they want to hit on, is it? Let's talk about it for three weeks. Easy transition from the morons who are talking 
talking about it and us. There you go. All right. Well, it's nice to know that you went ahead and put that on yourself. Uh, by the way, just a quick reminder, if you do want to read anything that Rick Harrell has to say, God knows I can't decide why. Uh, HarrellSports.com is a good place to do it. And you're going to stop by from time to time, aren't I'm you? I'm going to stop by on a regular basis because it, it's fun. It beats a, a sharp stick in your eye here. Uh, but not by much uh, on <laughs> my side of things. Bit. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, breaking. We're back with the one-on-one -on -one look at the man who might have one day become president and still might. Then we're heading for the second hour of Midpoint featuring baby boomer survival and a state of the union that is not shocking in any way.